person, and I really wish I could see each and every one of you as I was able to a year ago. Being the first woman in mission control, a lot of people want to know when they meet me, how did I get there? And how did I end up becoming an activist in women's rights? And those are actually one story. Um, when I was graduating from the University of Texas in Austin, women who went to college were really expected to just go there to become wives. They were The degree they were looking for was an MRS. Uh, and if they were working, it was to be a backup in case they lost their husband or something, some tragedy happened. And the jobs that they were going into were going to be very stereotypical. A college educated woman would become a nurse, a, do, a, a teacher maybe, or an executive secretary. I wasn't really interested in any of those when I got out. The last thing I had in mind, oh, and I want to see if I can figure out how to do these slides on here. Um, the last thing that I had in mind was the moon. I hadn't thought about it at all. I had taken a course in celestial mechanics, but I had no expectation of working in the space program, but I, I got an interview and I was uh, hired by a company that was a, an aerospace contractor, TRW Systems was the name of it. They're now part of uh, Northrop Grumman. And that's when I began a short course in sex discrimination. Uh, I guess I knew it, but I'd never, I didn't have words for it at the time. We didn't really have the language of that, but I was hired as a computerist. Uh, a gendered computer. And uh, it, in that company, as it turns out in other companies as well, was a stereotypical female job for women that had math skills. If any of you have seen Hidden Figures, those women were called computresses as well. Uh, at the time I was going into the field, we we had computers, actual computers, they, and they were actually fairly powerful, not as compared to today, but they could do a lot, really. But they were batch processors, not, not something that you interacted with as we do today. So I did a lot of number crunching. Uh, after about three months, I had sort of a revelation. I looked around and it occurred to me that I was as smart as these guys I was working with. I didn't have exactly the same background, but I was as smart as they were. But I wasn't getting paid anywhere close to as much as they were. Uh, they were driving uh, Corvettes and I was driving about a 10 year old junky used car. And I thought, I think I need to get their job, not my job. And uh, so I started really working hard and trying to learn as much as I could about what uh, was going on in terms of exactly what the goals were in the, in the business. And uh, after six months, um, the operations manager told me that he planned to promote me at the end of a year and I would become a member of the technical staff. I didn't get promoted after a year. It was more like a year and two or three months. And the reason for the delay was another lesson in sex discrimination at the time. Uh, the operations manager told me that it would have been easier to have fired me and rehired me uh, because the pay gap was so big between where I was and where I needed to be. And that in fact, he wasn't able to pay me what he thought he should pay me. That he had had to fight corporate headquarters just to get me to the bottom of the pay scale of a member of the technical staff. And he thought I needed to be higher than that. That's a problem that still exists today for women. And you need to understand that you will never catch up if you, if you get behind in your pay. They will tend to use what your prior pay was to base your next pay on. And so it's very important from the beginning as a young woman going out into, into business to get paid what you're worth from the start and to always keep insisting on it. 
even today we have women, the studies have shown that uh, women who come out of college with exactly the same background, taking exactly the kind of grades, exactly the same kind of job, within a year or two, they're behind in terms of pay. So it's an ongoing battle for women. And, you know, we have to fight it every day. So I want to encourage you to keep that in mind. Uh, I was very fortunate. I had a um, progressive company, a progressive boss. Uh, quite frankly, most bosses wouldn't have fought for a woman to get promoted because he had to fight very hard for me to get promoted into that position. I worked on the return to Earth capability, that's trajectory work to bring the astronauts back to the Earth from the moon. And it was really an unexpected surprise, really, that I ended up in the, in the control center. I had no idea that I was going to be the first woman in mission control. I knew there weren't very many women because I was the only woman in most rooms where I sat, you know. Um, but I had no idea I was going to be the first that became fairly obvious after I went over there. They accelerated the schedule on Apollo 8. The flight controllers weren't used to doing return to earth maneuvers. It was a whole new game and they needed help. And that's why uh, the people from the team I was on at TRW went over there to uh, become, they called us initially abort support and then we were called um, retro support eventually. So what was it like? Well, many of you may be the only girl in your class if you're in college. If you're out in the professional world, you may be the only woman in the room. And if you've had this feeling that they're looking at you, I'm here to tell you they are looking at you. OK, they are watching. you. Um, one day I in the control center, uh, have my headphones on. This is sort of the classic picture that people would people show from that time. Have my headphones on. You have all of these uh, screens in front, all these uh, stations that you're hearing. And I could hear some chatter about, look at what's on channel 52. I don't remember the number of the channel, but 52, for example. And I would hear that occasionally. Oh, you can't believe what's on 52. After a couple of days, I thought, I wonder what's on 52. It was me. They had a camera. It was just on me. And of course, that made me feel very self-conscious. I started thinking, what have I been doing? Um, and you're going to have that feeling occasionally. My attitude toward it was, am I going to let these people get under my, you know, into my brain? Or am I going to do my job. And I decided that, you know, I was going to take the attitude. I'm here. I'm a woman. Get used to it. Rather than having a chip on my shoulder, rather than saying it's sexual harassment or something like that. Because the truth of the matter is I was like a purple cow or a giraffe in the room. They'd never seen a woman in the room before, but they will get used to it. So, you know, remember, just keep doing your job and, you know, remember you have to be part of a team. And when I say they'll get used to it, look at that. Those are the women flight controllers in the space shuttle mission in 2007. Look at all of those women. They do get used to it. Um, it takes a while and each one of you is probably going to be breaking barriers. Uh, and you're going to have to be tough and resolute and you may have to take some, you know, bad times, uh, but you can do it. Um, I like to show this picture of Rosalie Lopez because in the 50th anniversary for Apollo 11, I was contacted by the Brazilian consulate and they wanted to put me in contact with Rosalie. Rosalie wanted to reach out to me because when she was a little girl in Brazil 50 years ago, during the flight of Apollo 13, she saw a picture of me in a newspaper in Brazil. And that inspired her to become a planetary scientist. 
Now, this is astonishing to me. Halfway around the world, you know, a little girl sees a picture of a woman doing an engineering job, and it actually affects what she does in the future. Rosalie shows pictures of me when she goes out and talks to young girls. I like to return the favor and show pictures of Rosalie. Uh, she's pretty spectacular. She is a, a volcanologist. Uh, she has the world's record for finding volcanoes. And guess where most of them are? They're on the moons of Jupiter. And she works at JPL. But the, the message I want you to understand is that each of you is an example and an inspiration for the women that come after you. And, you know, rather than keep showing, I enjoy showing Rosalie's picture, but I'm hoping I'll get to show some of your pictures as well. Uh, you're going to be breaking barriers. Uh, sometimes it'll be fairly easy. Sometimes it'll be difficult. But try to be uh, supportive of other women because you need their support and they need yours as well. I would also encourage you to try to get involved. When I stopped working in the space program after having worked on Apollo 8, 10, 11, 12, and 13, they were phasing out um, a lot of the what I considered the interesting work in lunar exploration. And I went on to become the women's advocate for the city of Houston, uh, where I was trying to help improve the you know, number of women that were in government positions, uh, boards and commissions as well as improving the treatment of rape victims, domestic violence victims, and so forth. And it's very important to become engaged in your community. Right now, I do a lot of voter registration to the extent that I can. We have a virus going on, so I can't do the kinds of things I usually do, but I'm very active on social media, especially on Twitter. I hope you will remember and send me a picture of you so that I can show your picture and tell something about your story about what you're doing great in the world. Again, I wish I could see and meet each of you. Thank you. So much. We are going to be taking some questions. So if anyone wants to go into our Q&A section, we can go ahead and ask questions. You know, Poppy, I'll start with the first question actually for you. Um, can you name, you know, even after your experience there as the first woman in mission control, did you face any one moment of um, resistance in your career because you were a woman? And how did you handle that? Well, I think the whole environment was resistant to women being in the, in the field. Uh, the, the main thing I did was focus on trying to be a member of the team and focus on trying to make the people around me think of me as a member of the team. Uh, and really that, I think more than anything, helped me get the promotion was the people around me didn't understand why I wasn't a member of the technical staff because I was doing the same work they were. So I tried to get them to become advocates for me. And how did you deal with mansplaining? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Uh, I think that might just be a genetic characteristic. And uh, engineers in particular, uh, they just like to explain. I don't even think of it so much in sexist terms. Uh, you know, that's, you know, some of the guys that you work around just like to explain a lot. Uh, and, and, you know, just move on. You know, don't worry about it too much. And Grace has a question. What was it like when you were working on Apollo 11? And what was it like seeing the first humans on the moon? Well, right was, the I was not actually in the space center uh, during the landing itself. 
my work was to get them back to the earth from the moon and you're not going to be bringing them back uh, when they're on the on the surface. You have to wait till they get back in orbit with uh, the capsule. Uh, I was at home, I was resting because it's really important whenever uh, you, you, ha you have to rest, you know, in order to be able to do your job. It was very exciting to see them land. Uh, it was um, something that we'd been working on for many, many years. So it was tremendously exciting. Although for me, actually, the most exciting mission was eight. And that was the first one that I was in the control center on. And the first time they, they uh, went lunar. And Bridget says you're an inspiration as a scientist and activist. Any suggestions about bridging the gap between activism and the workplace? Well, I was an activist while I was there, um, especially once that we had another woman who was on the technical staff that joined me. Uh, I, I felt like I didn't just have one other person. I felt like, you know, suddenly it's like we were 20 of us. Uh, just have one other woman that was on the technical staff. And with NTRW, we set up, a, you know, an Equal Employment Opportunity Advisory Committee. We started uh, arguing with management about how benefits were handled in terms of the treatment of uh, pregnancy in particular. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you always have the opportunity to do this. You just need to reach out and do it and become aware and become involved in your community as well. And we have time for one more question from Elizabeth. Were there any points in your career where being the only woman was actually the strength for the team? Perhaps. Uh, a lot of what I did involved testing uh, to try to get uh, the program flight ready. We were backing ourselves up. We didn't have another independent backup on the return to earth capability. And obviously, if you're in an abort situation, the last thing you need is for your abort program to fail. Um, I I think because I was the only because I was the only woman, it was easier for me uh, and more of an inspiration for me to really challenge. Uh, the guys that I worked with, uh, they would be very arrogant about their programming, that they had designed these perfect systems. And I would take great pleasure in being able to walk in the very next day after I was given it to test with a big stack of error printouts and say, look at all the bugs I found. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I really enjoyed uh, the challenge of being able to do that. And as we come to a close, uh, just one quick, uh, one other question from Laura. Who is your role model? Do you have a role model? Each one of you girls out there is my role model. I didn't really have a role model at that time uh, because there just weren't any women that were in these kinds of fields at all. But today I look at each one of y'all as role models. What a great way to close. Thank you so much, Poppy Northcutt, for joining us. We, you're literally all of our role model as well. We appreciate you. So we're going to end this session and we will see you back here in just one moment in the next session. Uh, uh. Thank you so much.